All right, so to for for our uh, for our business and our purposes here. Not a whole lot on the upcoming schedule. I know the screen's just coming down now. Um, it was my and continues to be my intent that with the way that the schedule is structured um, and how Monday is our only day off between the beginning of the semester and well, essentially the end of the semester. Um, it is my full intent to try to give you as much of a break as possible. So if you notice, there are very few assignments that are actually due before we meet again. Um, you do have these proficiency items. If these proficiency items are still on your to-do list, that's kind of on you at this point. They've been available now for three full weeks. Um, but you have the elements proficiency, um, which is due at 75%, and the ions proficiency, which is due at 100%. Both of those are due Sunday night. Again, if you haven't done elements yet, this is your last opportunity to get points for elements. Uh, so if you're in that small minority that hasn't finished that um, proficiency yet, um, this is your last opportunity to get something for it. After Sunday, it completely goes away. Uh, you still have to pass it to pass the course, but you no longer get points for it, which is going to be a considerable hit to your grade if you're looking at it from that standpoint. Um, IONS is at 100%. Uh, if you don't pass it by Sunday, you have one more week to pass it for credit. The next uh, proficiency deadline, according to our schedule in uh, Blackboard, is on um, one month from now, actually. The bonus deadline for nomenclature is October 4th, so one month from today, um, with due dates kind of succeeding from there. The only other assignment that is due before next Wednesday's class is the post lecture for this class. Um, which is going to focus on and regard empirical formulas. So if you understood what we, what you were asked to do on Wednesday with the activity from Wednesday, this is going to fall very nicely into that package. It's more or less an application of those gram to mole calculations that you had to do. The only other announcement that I have at this point is that your chapter two homework and your chapter two quiz, if you look on the syllabus, the syllabus says that both of those are due Tuesday night. I've actually moved that. Again, in this same kind of vein of it's been three weeks, it's going to be another 12 weeks before we get a true day off let's actually have a day off kind of thing. So to that end, I moved this to Thursday. So the chapter two quiz will make an appearance Thursday at midnight. So uh, 12 midnight um, between Wednesday and Thursday. You'll have all day Thursday until 1159 p.m. to complete it. So I basically just shifted that by two days. So take it for what it is. If you want to use the time and, 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 and have the time off, by all means. If you want to use it as a way to just kind of chip away at the work so that you don't have to do as much at once, that's not a bad strategy either. But 
that is what you are ultimately looking at for the next few days. Starting on Wednesday next week, we will be getting into chapter three. Chapter three for most of you is going to be the place where we start to get into some really new material. Um, for the most part, chapters one and two have been largely reviewed. Chapter three is where we'll actually see something new. And just to put this out um, and put it on your radar, after chapter three, um, and if you look at the schedule, after chapter three, uh, we're going to get into, uh, that'll be the end of our exam one material. So um, the Monday that follows that chapter three quiz, see here that we've got exam one scheduled. That's actually three weeks from this coming Monday. So we are coming up on our first exam. Um, and so I'm not going to say that now is the time to prepare for that because, again, it's almost a month from now. But understand that after the third chapter, which we will be in for about two weeks, after that third chapter, we are going to get our first exam. And so um, we'll probably try to schedule something in here between exam or between chapter three quiz and exam one as some kind of a review period. It's going to be outside of class. It'll be virtual over Zoom. So I know not everybody will be able to make it, but hopefully a good number of you will. And it'll give us an opportunity to talk about, you know, what the exam looks like, how it's structured going to be, that kind of thing. Any questions before we get started? All right, so we're into the last phase of chapter three, or excuse me, chapter two rather. And in this part, we are dealing with, with largely two concepts that we have not dealt with yet. One of them is the idea of percent composition. Percent composition or mass percent just tells us what percentage, what amount of one element versus another is ultimately present in a given compound. Now thus far, we've been largely concerning ourselves with molar percentage or atomic ratio where I can look at something like Wustite here, FeO, and compare that to hematite, Fe2O3, and note that this has a one-to-one -one ratio of iron to oxygen, and this has a two-to-three or, or one-to-one-and-a-half ratio of iron to oxygen. And thus far, that's really all that we've said. If you recall back to the calculations that you had to do on Wednesday, if I had to go from moles of a compound to moles of an element, I used that ratio inside of the chemical compound to do that calculation. One mole of iron three oxide has three moles of oxygen. One mole of iron three oxide has two moles of iron. Well, percent composition doesn't concern itself with mole ratio. It concerns itself with mass ratio. And to that mass ratio end, what we have to do is take into consideration two things. First, the molar mass, the aggregate molar mass of all of the elements 
atoms for the particular thing that we're looking at. So if I'm looking at iron, I would need to look at the mass of all the irons in the formula and compare that with the overall mass of the compound. So it falls generally into this formula. I'm just going to use A as a generic element in the compound. And if I'm doing percent A, it would be total mass of A divided by the total mass of the compound multiplied by 100 percent. Now, how do I apply this to something like iron oxide? Well, this is where the periodic table is going to come into handy for us. For iron oxide, I have FeO, which means I have iron at 55.85 grams per mole. And I've got oxygen at 16.00 grams per mole. Wasn't here to tell you this on Wednesday. If it didn't come through on the video, I apologize. When we are using molar masses off of the periodic table, we don't want our masses to limit our significant figures in any kind of way. General rule of thumb, two decimal places. So if I can carry out my measurements on the periodic table to two decimal places, that covers me in most circumstances. So to find the percent iron, I need the total mass of iron, which is just one, 55.85 times the one mole of iron. And the denominator, 55.85 for the iron and 16 for the oxygen. Our percent of iron, 55.85 divided by 55.85 plus 16. If I do the, divid the addition first, I get 71.85. Multiply by 100%, and I get 77.73. Now for the oxygen, I could follow a very similar kind of process. where I could do percent oxygen is equal to 16.00 grams divided by the same 71.85 grams multiplied by 100% percent oxygen would be 16 divided by 71.85 Multiply by 100, 
22.27%. So that's certainly one process. One of the nice things about percentages, though, is that they are married to each other. If I have a compound that has two elements in it, and I know the percent composition of one of the elements, the other one is known to me as well because they have to add up to 100%. So the other way that I could have done this was I could have said, okay, 100 minus 77.73 would have given me the same 22.27%. So keep that in mind, because especially if you get into some of the more complicated examples here, where you've got several elements in the same compound, doing that subtraction step at the very last step can actually save you a little bit of time, because that's one fewer division that you would have to do. So, and certainly in this case, that saves you a lot of time. If I already know that one component is 77%, the other one's got to be 23%. That's how percentages work. They have to add up to the whole. All right, any questions about percent composition? Okay, so this transitions into empirical formulas, and it does so in somewhat of an elegant kind of way, because what we ultimately end up talking about here with percent composition is percent composition can be a useful tool to helping us to get to empirical formulas. We can convert the masses into moles and basically kind of flip the equation around. Use the moles to figure out the mole ratio to figure out the formula of the compound. An empirical formula, by definition, is the smallest whole number ratio of one element to another in a compound. The smallest whole number ratio of one element to another in a compound. So what that means, first of all, I can't have any fractional or decimal subscripts. They all have to be whole numbers. The second, it has to be non-reducible. So if I look at a compound and I see that I can divide all of the digits in that compound by two, if I can divide all the digits in that compound by three, then it's not an empirical formula. What it is instead is a molecular formula. Molecular formulas are the actual formulas of any given compound. And they do not have to adhere to the smallest part of the whole number ratio. There's still a whole number ratio. After all, we can't have fractions of atoms but they don't have to be reducible. And so what we will find, especially when we get into some of the more interesting kinds of organic situations, is that a number of different molecular formulas can be born out of the same empirical formula. So if I have an empirical formula, it can actually be replicated a number of different times to give us a number of different molecular formulas. So the question is, if I have an empirical formula, how do I know what the molecular formula is for that compound? And the answer to that usually leads us down the road of some kind of process called mass spectroscopy. Now, if you read in your book, chapter two, the last section or two, gets into mass spectroscopy and how mass spectroscopy works and, and what it does. And frankly, for this class, we're not interested in it. 
very few of you, if any, are actually going to ever use a max spectrometer. But we can understand what it does. And what that machine ultimately does is it takes a molecule, blasts it with energy, and causes it to fragment, and then it picks up the masses of the different fragments. What that ultimately can give us is the total mass of a given formula. So if I have a molecule, I run it through mass spectroscopy, I get the molecular weight of the substance as part of that analysis. Now the analysis generates tons more information than just that. But for our purposes, that's the primary thing that we would be looking at is, oh, the molar mass of this substance is 240 grams per mole. And what I can do with that is with that information here, I can compare that molar mass to the molar mass of the empirical formula and get a number, a multiplier. The molecular formula is seven times more massive than the empirical formula. And if that is the case, all I have to do is multiply those subscripts in the empirical formula by seven to get the molecular formula as a result. As I mentioned, mass percent does kind of feed into empirical formulas, and it does so in the following way. If I have an empirical formula, what I need to do is this. I'm going to take those mass percentages that I'm given, and I'm going to convert them into masses. So that 77.73% of iron would get turned into 77.73 grams of iron. That 22.27% of oxygen would get converted into 22.27 grams of oxygen. So basically, I just take that percent sign and I turn it into a gram. Now that I have everything in masses, I apply what we did on Wednesday, turn the masses into moles by dividing by the atomic mass of the given element. And then the last step here is probably the most tricky. Once I have the moles of everything, I need to convert those moles into whole numbers. Now there's several processes that can go into doing that. Most often it starts with just taking the smallest number of moles and dividing everything else by that number. And usually what happens when we do that is it'll pop up that, okay, we have a one for that particular element. And the other ones either turn into whole numbers themselves also, or become recognizable fractions, like one half, or one third, that we can manipulate with an additional calculation step at the end. So this step here, this last one, is probably the most difficult. Not because it's really truly difficult math, but because it's kind of deceptive. There are a lot of different ways that you can go, and if you make the wrong interpretation, you can ultimately make the wrong conclusion. So it's something we're going to have to watch out for as we do some examples. So in this one, what is the empirical formula for an iron oxide compound? That is 69.94% iron and 30.06% oxygen. So we follow the process. Percent turns into grams. So I have 69.94 grams of iron and I have 30.06 grams of oxygen. So that was step one. Turn the percents into masses. 
And all I do is basically just change the unit. Second step, I need to turn these masses into moles using the mole conversion that we were learning on Wednesday. So dimensional analysis, grams in the denominator, moles in the numerator, one mole of iron is equal to 55.85 grams of iron in the denominator. I do the calculation, 69.94 divided by 55.85 to four significant figures. A little note on sig figs here. Ultimately, they are not going to be super important other than um, if we carry the correct number through the calculations, we have a less chance of getting a rounding error so that if it does come out with kind of a wonky ratio, it'll be a lot easier to recognize if we've done our sig figs properly through the first two steps. In the end, we're looking for a whole number ratio, so sig figs kind of go out the window by the time we get to the end here. But in these steps, it still is important not to round too much. You round too much, and a 1.25 turns into a 1.3, and you end up multiplying by three when you should have multiplied by four. It does make a difference. The, the little rounding errors do add up in those kinds of circumstances. So I need you to continue to be diligent about the sig fig use through this early part of the calculation. So four sig figs here, 1.252 moles of iron. Oxygen, one mole of oxygen is 16.00 grams. Thirty point zero six divided by sixteen. Four sig figs again, one point eight seven nine moles of oxygen. So sometimes the more ratios coming out of this step are pretty obvious. The two numbers come out to be exactly the same we know that they're a one-to-one -one ratio. Or if they're like the same within a little bit of rounding, we know that they're a one-to-one -one ratio. In this case, it's not quite as obvious what it is. So what I have to do is I've got to get these into whole numbers somehow. Easiest way to do that is divide all of the numbers by the lowest number that's left. 1.252. Why 1.252? It's the smallest number. So I'm not going to have any numbers less than one after this step. And two, it guarantees that I have at least one whole number. And that number here in this case is one. 1.252 divided by 1.252 is 1. 1. 1.879 divided by 1.252, 1.500. So I'm not out of the woods yet. I don't have whole number ratios. But like I said, out of this step, should come very recognizable fractions. If it ends in 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.75, 0 0.33, 0 0.66, 0 0.67, we recognize those are one quarter, three quarters, 
one half, one third, two thirds. And to get rid of that fractional component that is left over, and there's usually only one fractional component that we have to worry about, we just need to multiply by the denominator of that fraction. So if I'm dealing with a quarter, whether it's one quarter or three quarters, I'm going to multiply everything by four. If I'm dealing with a third or two thirds, we're going to multiply everything by three to get rid of the thirds. In this case, I have a definitive half. So I'm going to multiply both of these by two, which means I'm going to have two iron and three oxygen. My empirical formula, Fe2O, or excuse me, Fe2O3. And that matches up our other iron mineral from the first problem. So there are some steps that are involved here. There is a little bit that has to be done. But overall, this is pretty straightforward. The thing to watch out for is, again, this last step is always the trickiest. Getting from mole numbers to whole numbers always involves the most kind of mental work because there are the most places where you can make mistakes. But if you can kind of figure your way through it, you do ultimately get to the correct answer or at least to an answer that makes sense. Any questions with this example? Yes, Aniki? So this last step where we multiply by two, that is not always going to be the case. So if you have to multiply by something, it's you adjusting to what are the numbers that came out of this step here. So I had a one and a one and a half. Because I had a half and not a whole, I had to multiply by something to get rid of the half. So I multiplied by two. If it came out as thirds, I'd have to multiply by three. If they came out as whole numbers, I wouldn't have to multiply by anything. So this last little bit here, this is an adjustment. And the adjustment that you make is solely based upon the results of the calculation that you did. And so I can't tell you that it's going to be definitively one direction or another. It's you have to react to what the numbers say to make the appropriate calculation thereafter. Any other questions? Okay, structures containing the mineral magnetite are found in avian beaks and may help birds navigate. Magnetite is an oxide of iron that is 72.36% iron by mass. What is its empirical formula? And then we've got a secondary question here about its molar mass and its molecular formula. Our process here is going to be very, very similar. Seventy two point three six grams of iron compared to twenty seven point six four grams of oxygen. I do my calculations through. It's going to be again very similar since we're talking about the same compound, well, the same elements rather. 
55.85 grams of iron per mole, 16 grams of oxygen per mole, Seventy two point three six divided by fifty five point eight five gives us one point two nine six moles of iron, twenty seven point six four divided by sixteen gives us one point seven two eight moles of oxygen. So very similarly to the last problem, I don't have whole numbers coming out of the first step. I don't have a readily apparent ratio. I can't look at the ratio of the two and say, oh, well, that's definitely two to one, or that's definitely three to one. I'm gonna have to do further calculation once again, we divide by the smaller number, the smallest number, 1.296. That leaves us with one iron, 1.728 divided by 1.296 gives us 1.333. For oxygen. And so once again, this is a clear cut. Hey, there's a fraction in here. We got to get rid of the fraction. 0.333 is one third. So we need to multiply both of these by three. That means we're going to have three iron. Let me take a bit for color. Here. Three iron for four oxygen, which would be Fe3O4. So that's the first half of the problem. We have found the empirical formula. The question is, what is the molecular formula? Well, to solve that, I need to take this compound and find its molar mass. Molar mass of magnetite is three irons plus four oxygens. 3 times 55.85 plus 4 times 16. I get 231.55 grams per mole. And so I compare. In this case, they're the same. If I had to do the calculation, it'd be N is equal to the molar mass, 231.5, divided by the empirical mass, 231.55. My grams per mole is canceled. I get one. I actually get 0.99 something, which we're going to round to the nearest whole number, which is one. And so in this case, my empirical formula is the same as my molecular formula, Fe3. Oh, cool.
And that is possible. It is entirely possible to have the same empirical and molecular formula. It just depends on the circumstances. It depends on how the whole thing's put together. In ionic compounds in particular, we do tend to see that relationship far more often where the empirical and the molecular formulas are the same. In molecular compounds, things that are covalently bonded together, there is more variance, there is more variation because there are different kinds of covalent bonds that can be made. Single bonds, double bonds, triple bonds, and the like. And because of that variability, we can see different empirical and molecular formulas a lot more often in those cases. All right, any questions about this example? Okay, this is our final problem of the week. Final problem of the day, final problem of the chapter. I'm gonna let you go on this on your own. I'm gonna kind of weave around and see how you're doing. Phosphorus burns in pure oxygen with a bright white light. Product of the reaction, 43.64% phosphorus, 56.36% oxygen. The molar mass of this product is 284 grams per mole. What are the empirical and molecular formulas? So go ahead, you've got the better part of uh, about seven, eight minutes. Try to write this out, figure it out. And I'll come around and check and see how you're doing. Help put you in the right direction if you're uh, getting stuck. So process is pretty straightforward and close to the same as what you had been doing. Um, the big difference, the change was um, below this line here. What you did, what you had to do with that empirical mass is you had to divide it into the molecular mass to give you the multiplier, which was two. And what that meant is that the empirical formula was half of the molecular formula. The molecular formula was twice as much. So you take that empirical formula, you multiply it by two, that's how you get the molecular formula. P2O5 is the empirical, multiplied by two, that's P4O10. So that completes for us chapter two. As I said, nothing on Monday. Enjoy the day off. Wednesday, we're coming back, we're going to start right into chapter three, talking about light, energy, and a whole bunch of stuff involving electrons. Have a good extended weekend.